morning. Today's reading is from Acts chapter 2, the whole chapter. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with your joy and in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. 
God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together at the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your work. Lord, um, we could just end the service right there. Hearing, hearing the preaching from Peter, hearing the word and hearing the way that your Holy Spirit just did amazing things in the past. And so Jesus, I just pray that you'd make it abundantly clear to us what you have for us today, what you need to challenge us on, what you need to encourage us in. And Lord, I pray that we won't just hear, Lord, but we'll be quick to obey what you have for us. Pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Get that one up. Thanks, Rob. What's Holy Spirit got to do with coffee? Well, I just thought revival. When I think revival, I think the first revival I have in the morning is from coffee. <laughs> Wakes me up. Gets you awake. And that's another word for revive, is to wake up. Revival. Overflow of the Spirit. We're doing a series at the moment on the overflow, and this week we're looking at the overflow of the Spirit. And the reason I put revival up there is because that's another word. When the Holy Spirit revives His people, He, he overflows. An outpouring of the Spirit. Maybe you've heard it put this way, a, a baptism of the Spirit. Right? So these powerful moments where Holy Spirit breaks in and changes things in this world in a, in a radical way. And throughout church history, there have been many revivals or awakenings and also many so-called revivals and awakenings. Some of these have completely changed the shape of the church and even the shape of culture around it. And some just sort of fizzled out before they almost began. But one thing that all these revivals have in common is that they're finished, right? There is only one revival which is still going, and that is the one that we read here in Acts 2, the beginning of the church. But every other bringing to life has lasted for a season and then ended. So when we're talking about revival, we're not talking about something at the moment which continues indefinitely. We're talking about a special outpouring of Holy Spirit for a season to accomplish something. So the question we should be asking is, well, what is revival? What, what, what is revival and should we be praying for it? What is Christian revival? And so, I've got three questions to ask within those two questions, and that is, how does revival come? What is revival for? And what is the response? I'm sorry, it's a little bit smaller than I intended it to be up on the screen there. First thing, how does revival come? You know, there, there was a thinking back around, just after the time of the first Great Awakening, back with Jonathan Edwards, and if you know any of your church history around them, it, it shook, it shook America. Like, thousands of people coming to faith. Um, and shortly after that, there, there came this line of thinking from other evangelists that revival was something that you could manufacture. That if you had the right songs, if you had the right speaker, if you had the right atmosphere, the right location, that revival would happen, the Holy Spirit would be outpoured. Like you could manufacture it somehow. 
And that has persisted. That's something that still happens. And you can see signs in various places in the US, often in the south, there'll be like a, a tent and there'll be a sign, revival here this Friday, saying the Holy Spirit is going to move, we guarantee it, essentially. But that sort of thinking that we can manufacture revival, I think is crept into how we do church as well, doesn't it? We, we sort of judge church on how things have been. You know, oh, the singing was great today, so Holy Spirit was definitely with us. The pastor was preaching really well, so, you know, we know Holy Spirit was here and he was doing things. Or maybe we see it the other way, oh, they weren't the songs that I really like. If we'd just done some of these, it would have been better. If, if we'd just, if we'd had a better preacher, maybe revival would have happened in our service. That sort of thinking that we can manufacture revival has crept into not just revivals as a whole, but into how we think about church. And I know I've often thought those same things. Oh, you know, that mix of songs wasn't great. And that's been sometimes what I've led as well. I'm like, oh, why did I pick those? But the problem with that sort of thinking that we can manufacture revival is it puts all the impetus. The ball is in our court. And suddenly it's about what I can do to make revival happen. And if we're getting it right, and then Holy Spirit has to do it. And then we judge whether it's successful on whether we feel like it's happened. See, it's no longer about Jesus or about Holy Spirit. It becomes about me and my emotional. So I think that sort of thinking that we can manufacture revival is inherently wrong. It's got to be wrong. So, instead, let's have a look at what the Bible says about revival. And that's why we're looking in Acts chapter 2. Keep your finger in Acts chapter 2 and flip back to Acts chapter 1 because we need a bit of context if we want to know how revival comes. If revival doesn't come by something we've manufactured, it's got to come from God. And Acts chapter 1 gives us a great spot for it. It starts with Jesus' promises. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Jesus says, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus saying to his disciples, there is going to be something different. Holy Spirit is going to outpour in a new way that you have not experienced before. Jesus promises this to them. And down in verse 14, he says, um, this is the response of, of the disciples. This is what they did after they heard these words from Jesus. All of these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So everyone who believed gathered together and they prayed. And they were devoting themselves to prayer. Everyone. The whole community. Not just the leaders, not just the apostles, not just the men who were following as well, but it specifically mentions the women were there as well, along with Mary and Jesus' brothers, which is important because if you read a little bit earlier in the Gospels, you find that Jesus' brothers didn't believe that Jesus was actually who he said he was. We looked at that last week, didn't we? So they're all together praying. That's where it starts. Revival has to start with a promise of Jesus. The starting point isn't the right band. The starting point isn't an international speaker. The starting point isn't a stadium or a tent. The starting point is a promise of Jesus that he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit and his people gathering together and praying and seeking his face. Lord, send your spirit. And we see this continue in chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, it says, They were together. And because chapter 2 flows from chapter 1, I'd assume that them praying about the Holy Spirit in chapter 1, about his arrival, is going to carry on to chapter 2. So again, everyone's together, they're in this room, they're praying, and then suddenly, remarkable things happen. You know, a rushing wind from heaven, the whole place is shaken, there are tongues of fire split. I mean, that's mind-blowing. I have never, ever, ever experienced that. I don't think anyone else has. Not in the same way. Holy Spirit just did something amazing. And the thing that, that I think is so important to pick up here 
is it says, suddenly, there was a rushing wind. Suddenly. This was unexpected. Holy Spirit's arrival was unexpected. In one way, they were expecting him, because Jesus had said, wait for what I'm going to give. But it wasn't that they'd worked themselves up to like a, a state of euphoria and then Holy Spirit was poured out. It wasn't a case of they did the right things and then Holy Spirit was poured out. It was a case of they'd just come along to their daily prayer meeting and they were praying. And then God just floored them. Suddenly. We can't manufacture revival. It's purely from God. One thing which troubles me when I look at some of the um, more public charismatic things is when people start commanding Holy Spirit to do things. That troubles me greatly. When we say, Holy Spirit, you have to do this. You must arrive. You must be here. You must, must, must. I'm like, to me, that sounds an awful lot like blasphemy. Me having the arrogance to command God to do my will. We can't command revival to happen, but we can be down on our knees and say, Lord, would you make it happen? In your time, in your power, pour yourself out. We can ask, but we can never coerce or command Holy Spirit. Because he comes suddenly. He arrives precisely when he means to, and not by our own way. Holy Spirit does a brand new thing when he shows up in, in these sort of revivals. It's a new thing almost every time. If you look back through all the revivals of history, he does it in different ways. For some of them, it started out at prayer meetings, the revival in, in New York. Um, businessmen led that one, which is crazy to think about. The Great Awakenings were totally different. They started with a preacher preaching. Think of the things that happened with Billy Graham. It was a different setup again. You had big stadiums, right? When Holy Spirit comes, he does his own thing using his own means. We can't just copy paste and say, this is how it's going to work. And what he does in this first one, I'm not going to get too much into the symbology, but the rushing wind, the tongues of fire, reminds me a lot of in Exodus when the people were led by God. There was the pillar of fire that led them during the day and the cloud, sorry, that led them during the night and the cloud that led them during the day. Symbols of God's presence and I believe that that's why Holy Spirit manifested in that way in Acts to say, I am leading, I am here with you. The interesting thing in here, in verse 4, is it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And the word filled there in the Greek is filled to the top, to overflowing that's where we get our series from, right? Filled to the overflow of the Holy Spirit, as in totally saturated and soaked in the Holy Spirit. To me, when I read that, that says this is a special outpouring. This is a special outpouring. This is outside the, the normal experience of being a Christian. Because I don't know about you, but I don't always feel totally full of Holy Spirit totally ready to overflow so much so that he has absolute control of what's going on because that's the language of completely full in the Bible here I believe this is just for a season for something special that he wants to do because Romans 8 makes it very clear that if you've got Holy Spirit in you you're a believer right everyone who believes has the Spirit anyone who doesn't have the Spirit doesn't belong to Jesus I believe I follow Jesus. I've seen Holy Spirit at work in my life, but I wouldn't describe every single day as being totally full to overflow. And also, we can have a look at the um, apostles' lives to see that this was a special outpouring on them, right? Peter, who's just delivered this brilliant sermon, a sermon which 3,000 people come to faith. I mean, I love to do that, right? <laughs> We're happy when we get people come down the front for response time, right? We think, yes, that's great. But to have 3,000 people give their lives, amazing. The Holy Spirit at work through Peter. But uh, if we look a few years down the track, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21, you've got Paul saying, when Peter showed up to Antioch, 
Um, he refused to eat with the Gentiles and was sitting with the Jews and he separated himself. And you have Paul actually stands up in the middle of church and calls Peter out and says, hey, you're not living how you should be living. Now, this same Peter who delivered that message, if he was so totally overflowing with Holy Spirit his whole life, that couldn't happen, right? If Holy Spirit has complete control of us, if we are totally full, that sort of sin can't happen. So when we're talking about revival, when we're talking about an outpouring of Holy Spirit, we're talking about for a specific season or purpose that Jesus has for his church. So revival, how does it come? Not by ways that we work, but purely by Jesus sending the Holy Spirit in his own time in the way that he wants to send Holy Spirit. And it's for a season. We can't force it. So the second question. What for? Why does he send the Holy Spirit? Why are there seasons of revival? Why don't we just always have Holy Spirit to the max? Why is he always doing signs and wonders? Why is it only in, in bursts? I'm doing well today, I tell you what. <laughs> Break my tablet soon. Um, why is it in bursts? Can't tell you. I'll be honest. I don't, know, I don't know why God does what he does in his timing. I can take a guess and say maybe it's because he wants us to experience living our life normally without him totally overriding everything. Um, helping us to experience and, and want and yearn for these special seasons. I think that might be why. But let's have a look in this passage and see what are the uses Uses is a bad term. What what are the marks of of these sort of revivals, particularly in Acts 2? Again, need to flip back to Acts 1 to get this. And it's Jesus' comments in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is why Holy Spirit is poured out on his disciples. Jesus' own words. I'm not making this up. He says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, okay? You're going to receive power. This is going to be out of the ordinary. This is going to be amazing. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Holy Spirit is poured out in these amazing overflow ways so that we can be witnesses. For the sake of the gospel of Jesus, that is the primary purpose of a season of revival. It's not so much that we can suddenly feel really good and feel really full and we can just do like extra miracles and extra healing and and things that are out of the ordinary. Yeah, those come with it, but those aren't the primary purpose. Those are markers, those are pointers to Jesus. That's how you know if it's a true revival, if it's all pointing back to Jesus. If it's pointing back to the preacher and saying, how good is that preacher? Well, that ain't true revival. If it's all about my experience and my feeling, That ain't true revival. If it's all about all these things that are happening are pointing to Jesus, then that's true revival. So Jesus says you'll receive power to be able to spread the good news. And you know, Pentecost was not an accidental time. It tells us in verse 5 of Acts 2, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Alright, so the... All the Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire would gather together for Pentecost. It was a a big festival, a big feast, one of their big three. They're coming together to celebrate and Jesus chooses that moment to pour out his Holy Spirit because you're going to have people from different languages. You've got people who are speaking the Syrian tongue. You've got people who are um, speaking the high higher Roman Latin. You've got the the Greeks speaking different dialects of Greek. You've got all sorts of different languages coming together in one place. And most of them who aren't born Jews probably struggle if the priests doing the ceremonies are talking in, in Hebrew, in Aramaic. But then suddenly, Jesus' disciples are spreading the good news about Jesus in their own tongue. You see, the gift of tongues on Pentecost was given as a way of cutting down all the boundaries. There was no way that people could translate the gospel in that short a time. 
It was impossible. But Jesus made a way by his spirit. He can overcome anything by his spirit. No, no restrictions, no boundaries, no walls are enough to stop the advance of the gospel. Jesus will make a way because he is God and he has all the power. And it doesn't depend on our weakness for it to happen. That's why these seasons of outpouring of Holy Spirit generally have miraculous things that go along with it. Because it's God showing, even if you can't do it, I certainly can. Rely on me, not on yourselves. I love what it says in uh, verse 7. They were amazed and astonished, saying... Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? In other words, how are these backcountry bogans able to speak Latin? How are they able to speak my language? You know, these, these guys are... They probably haven't finished grade 10. How are they knowing multiple languages? This is impossible. Who are these? Like, it's really aggressive language against the disciples and the followers here. How are these hicks speaking French? You know, it's that sort of thing. Like, how did, where did they learn that? It's this amazement which is going on. That tells me that Jesus can use us in our weakness, doesn't it? Use us for more than we can ask or imagine. I mean, think about Peter. Put your foot in your own mouth, Peter. So many times with Jesus, he got things right. You are the Christ. And then remember what happened a couple of verses later. Jesus saying, Peter, get behind me, Satan. Right? Peter gets things right and then he puts his foot in his own mouth. Peter messes up. I, I, I really identify with Peter. <laughs> but then suddenly Peter, with all his failings, with all his messing up, delivers a sermon and 3,000 people are saved. If that's not the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't know what is. Because our New Testament record of Peter doesn't have him be that good an orator, that great at public speaking. The Holy Spirit can override our weaknesses. He can overcome any barriers that we might think we have to evangelism in these times of outpouring, in these times of revival and awakening. It's for the gospel. The second thing, and this is one of the, I don't want to say side effects, but one of the things that accompany Holy Spirit being outpoured for the sake of spreading the gospel is praise wells up within God's people. An absolute overflow of praise because if Holy Spirit is totally filling you, do you know what Holy Spirit's been doing for all eternity? Praising Father and Son. And so when Holy Spirit fills us, we praise God. We are filled to an overflow of wanting to worship. Worship becomes rich and alive and we encounter Jesus in powerful ways because Holy Spirit is so filling that again, if I've had a tough week, it can be hard to worship. When Holy Spirit pulls in, that all wipes away. Praise overflows. We see that in verse 11 where it says, Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own languages the mighty works of God. So the disciples are speaking in tongues and they're praising God. They're saying things like, You remember what God promised back in Isaiah? Through Jesus it happened. How good is that? Amen. Praise God. And there's all this like calling out God's praise. They were filled with excitement. The gospel was coming forth from their praise. And so what that sort of tells us is our witness is affected by our experience of Holy Spirit and Jesus. You can put a logical argument to why someone should be saved. It might have some effect. But when you present something saying, this is who, what he's done in my life, and they can see that he's genuinely changed you, that witness is much more powerful. But even then, that's still not enough. It needs the Holy Spirit to be working in them, to be drawing them to Jesus. So praise is something that comes along. It also provokes a response. Times of revival, of spiritual outpouring, provoke a response from people. It makes it very clear that it wasn't just an elite club of people who experienced it. It wasn't like a, a holy huddle and the church... The group of people revived and no one else knew about it. And it says, the place was shaken, there was a wind, there were tongues of fire, and everyone gathered together and they're like, what's going on? What's going on? 
This was something so big that the whole community turned out to see what's happening. If Capera caught real revival, you would have people in the streets saying, what is happening in this place? They'd be eager. It'd be something which provokes a response. What's different? There's something amazing. And that's why I don't think we've experienced a full revival as a church before. We haven't seen these signs of outpouring. We haven't seen people just flocking in and the church being constantly packed because Jesus is doing new and amazing things amongst his people. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right? We would love to see that. But if it's not in his season for revival to happen in that way, then we celebrate in the ones and twos who come in and are saved. And next Sunday evening, we are going to be celebrating Jacob Liddy's baptism. So that's another ones and twos, and by no means do we diminish that. By no means do we diminish that. But revival is a season of extraordinary provoking of the Holy Spirit. And there are two questions that people ask. See that in verse 12. They were all amazed and perplexed and saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mockingly said, they're filled with new wine. When Holy Spirit moves through us, He does it in amazing new ways. And for someone who's not experiencing that, who's looking on and seeing that, they're going to have to ask questions, aren't they? And we either ask, and this is talking about devout people who knew their Torah, they knew their Bible. Some of them ask, is this from God? What's happening? That's a good question to ask. When we see Holy Spirit doing new things that we haven't experienced before, when we see people claiming that God is doing these amazing things, we should ask, what's happening? Does this measure with what we see God's agenda is in the Bible? Does it glorify Jesus? We should ask, what's going on? This first crowd got it right. And I believe those ones who are asking what's happening were the same ones who, when Peter explained about Jesus, that they came to faith. Or they at least went home and thought about it. The other group just said, oh, they're speaking in tongues. They're speaking different languages. Even though everyone else is saying, this is amazing, they're speaking my language, they ignored that and said, nah, they're just drunk at nine in the morning. This whole crowd, of them, they're all drunk. They've had a big party. They're getting a little bit too excited. They worked themselves up and now they're drunk. I think, unfortunately, when it comes to our tradition, that we tend more towards that second group. If Holy Spirit's doing something big and amazing, we tend to doubt it straight away and not check it, but just say, oh no, that's something for those crazy panties to be doing. Or the happy, crap, clappy crowd. That's their thing. But that's not our experience of Holy Spirit, so it mustn't be God. I'd be very careful writing off anything without first measuring it against the Bible. Because I don't want to be found to be saying, your work, Holy Spirit, was actually just human drunkenness. And that would be a terrible indictment. So we should be very careful. We should be like the first group. Measure everything carefully if we are not experiencing the revival. See, is this part of the Bible? Is this part of what Jesus has? Or is this just human? Also, Holy Spirit being poured out is a sign of the end times. Revivals are a sign of the end times. From verse 16 to 21, um, Peter quotes from Joel. And we talked about Joel a little while ago. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Um, but when Joel speaks, he says, these are the signs of the end. And when Peter says, this is happening now, he's saying, the end times have begun. So when people ask, when are the end times? Is it going to be if things get even worse in the Middle East and then the end times are going to start? No. We've been in the end times for the last 2,000 years. That is the consistent story throughout the New Testament. When Jesus talks about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes, do you know why he says that? Because they've been happening for a long time. We are living in the end times and we should live like we're living in the end times. In other words, we don't know when Jesus returns. We should be living like every last day matters. Because one day, these end times will end. And the experience that Joel talks about is the one that I want to experience. Of speaking in, of your young men seeing visions, your old men dreaming dreams. <coughs> Holy Spirit being poured out on everyone to the fullness 
But again, what Joel said wasn't totally fulfilled on Pentecost, was it? Because I don't know how many of our kids prophesy. I don't know many of our young adult men, Toby, people like Toby, seeing visions. I don't know. Do all our young men see visions? Do all our old men dream dreams of Jesus? I don't think so. I don't think that's the experience yet. So there is still a greater fulfillment of Joel. A greater fulfillment at the end when we experience together the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The fullness of Jesus. But that comes at the end. Until then, these seasons of revival are little tastes of that. A little taste with the complete overwhelming of our own selves by Holy Spirit. The complete overwhelming of love and joy in Jesus. The complete obedience to spread the gospel because, you know, like the prophet who said, I have to speak because otherwise it feels like my bones are on fire if I try and hold it in, right? That's the sort of compelling if Holy Spirit is completely indwelling. If he's completely filling us up. And I don't believe we'll experience that totality permanently until Jesus returns. But until then, these moments are tastes of that and they're to be treasured. They're to be treasured. I remember years ago, it was probably the first time I read Acts 2. Um, I had questions about it. I was probably a teenager and I was talking to Dad about it. I don't know if he remembers, but um, I had questions about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. And we're reading through it and then we cracked open the commentary that I was using when I put this together. So that's still being put, put to good use. But as I was reading about this, just something happened in my heart. And I was just filled with this incredible joy this totally overwhelmed, wanting to like yell out, but I had no words. It felt like I was going to burst. I don't feel like that all the time. But for that time, I was blessed with that personal touch of Jesus. That personal touch by His Holy Spirit of this is who I am and I love you. One one pastor put it this way, it's kind of like um, these times of revival, these times of really close personal intimacy with with father are very much like a, a father walking their child along and they just spontaneously pick them up and give them a big hug. There's that closeness and the intimacy, but then you can't hold that hug forever. You put them down and you walk together again. It doesn't mean you're any less loved or any less close. These are special times. So they should be treasured. The signs of the end times, the times of when we're going to be able to experience that hug permanently. Intimacy, intimacy with Father and Jesus and Spirit permanently. So what's the response then? What's the public response to revival, to the outpouring of the Spirit? Verse 37. When they heard this, so when they'd heard the sermon that Peter had preached, they were cut to the heart, and Peter, Peter and the rest of, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, "Brothers, what shall we do?" Peter said to them, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself." And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, "Save yourselves from this crooked generation." So those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. The outpouring of Holy Spirit in a revival is so radical that it requires a response. There's no fence sitting when God displays his power in this way. You either say, yes, I am for this or no, I don't want a piece of this. I'm making an enemy. There's no fence sitting saying, I don't think I can, maybe I can, maybe I can't. This is a God making himself very clear through the signs that he performs during these times of revival. Requires a response. Pastor in America, Tim Keller, says, In a revival, sleepy Christians wake up, nominal Christians get converted, and non-Christians get reached. Sleepy Christians wake up. Nominal Christians, so people who come to church but have never really experienced Jesus, realize I've been missing Jesus this whole time. They get converted. 
and non-Christians finally get reached with the gospel. It requires a response. We see in verse 37 that those who thought they knew God were cut to the heart. Remember, these are devout Jews celebrating a holy festival. It says they were cut to the heart. So much so that they knew something had to happen. When they heard that Jesus had died for their sins, that they had killed Jesus, it wrecked them. It totally broke them. They said, brothers, what do we do? We're sinners. We're in a bad place. We, we've offended God. We deserve death. What do we do? The thing I love about this passage is God doesn't leave us there. When we come to that point of realizing our own wretchedness, and I tell you what, repentance is a huge part of revival. It happens. There is no revival without repentance. Where people publicly are coming forward saying, these are my sins and I confess them. But God doesn't leave us there at the at the confession, he doesn't leave us there in the down, in the, oh, you're a sinner and you're filthy, I'm going to crush you under my boot. No. No, no, no. Jesus is grace and mercy. There's a public mourning over sins, but then there's a restoration, and that comes with repentance. In verse 38, Peter says, you're feeling terrible? You feel the weight of your sin? There's one answer for that. Repent. Repent and be baptized. Repent. Stop walking your own way. Stop living your own life. Turn around and live Jesus' way. Put your trust in Him. Repent and be baptized. You see, I think we're good at remorse for sin. I know I'm good at remorse for sin, where we recognize that it's bad, we recognize that it damages us, people around us, and our relationship with God. But how are we with repentance? Because repentance isn't just recognizing, it's doing something about it. Changing something about it. Remorse means we're sorry for it and we know it's wrong, but nothing really changes. Repentance is a work done with the aid of the Holy Spirit, which takes actual steps to live in holiness with God. Okay? Remorse means we are sorry for our sin and we know it's wrong, but nothing really changes. Repentance is a work done with the Holy Spirit, which takes actual steps to live in holiness with God. See, repentance is a gift from God. Repentance isn't something I do. It's a gift, the Holy Spirit. When we say, I want Jesus, he says, all right, I'm going to come in and you work with me and we'll work together and we're going to change your life. We're going to run from those things. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you, right? Not just sit there and go, whatever, Jesus, you've got to do it. No, resist. We've got something in it. Flee from temptation, right? That's all part of repentance. There's something that we do with the aid of the Holy Spirit. It's that walking hand in hand thing that's going on. Repentance is part of it. It requires a response. And verse 39 makes it very clear that this is not something we do of our own will. It's not our work. It says, The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. We are such desperate sinners that we don't even know our need for Jesus. We don't even know how broken we are until he calls out and says, Hey, this is who I am. You don't realize that you're broken but I can fix you. I can make you new. It's a work of God that he reaches out in mercy, that he calls us. If he didn't call, we would never be saved. It's a work of God. And one of the physical ways that this inward change of repentance was demonstrated is through baptism. As I said, we're going to be celebrating Jacob's baptism. We've got another three young adults who are looking to be baptized in the next few months as well. And if you come along to those evening services, you'll hear that the reason they want to do this is because they follow Jesus and they want the world to know that I've stopped living my way and I want to live Jesus' way and I'm going to do that publicly. An outward symbol of an inward truth. 
Right? That's why baptism is such a powerful thing. Because A, it's obedience to Jesus. Jesus said, be baptized. Right? Great commission. As you go into the world, make disciples. Baptizing them. If we're not baptizing, we're not following the great commission. It's not just tell them about Jesus. It's baptize them. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always until the very end of the age, right? Jesus said, get baptized. Because it's a public way. It's a public thing. In revival, people publicly confess sin. Publicly are changed because we're not individual people. We're part of a body. So we do things publicly. And I tell you what, to the West, that is uncomfortable. Right? Confessing our sins before one another. I think some of us probably struggle to confess one-on-one -on -one to, to really close friends, let alone standing up in front of everyone and confessing. My goodness. But those are some of the things that happen in revivals. Because our fear of the Lord so outweighs our fear of what we think other people are going to think about. Our, and by fear, I mean our respect for Him and our trust and our knowledge that if He's going to forgive my sins, I don't care what other people think about me because He's changed me. And the last thing. Normal Christian work is done, but with new energy. So on top of all the signs and wonders that are going on, on top of all the incredible preaching and all these converts coming to faith, normal stuff was happening, but with a new energy. Verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Normal things were happening. They were being devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to the Word of God. There was fellowship happening. There was breaking of bread. There were prayers. These are all things that we're called to do as Christians, isn't it? There was awe as well. Awe of God and the work that He's doing through the, through the apostles. They were together in community. They had all things in common. They were sharing with each other. They were supporting each other. Again, the same things we're told to do all through the Bible. They would spend time in the temple, and when they weren't in the temple worshipping, they were at homes breaking bread, remembering Jesus, being in community, right? Normal Christian stuff, but with a renewed energy while the amazing things are happening as well. They were praising God, and they had great favor with the people around them. Normal Christian things happening, but with renewed energy, again, is another sign of revival. It's another response to revival. So back to our original question. What does revival look like? What does the outpouring of the Holy Spirit look like? The answer is whatever Holy Spirit wants it to look like. Whatever He wants it to look like as it points to Jesus and brings Jesus glory. It's for the sake of drawing people to Jesus in a more than ordinary way. There is a complete filling and an overflowing of the Holy Spirit for the cause of the gospel. So the second question, should we be praying for revival? Yes. 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 We should be praying for revival. We should be earnestly seeking that. Because as I said, I don't think as a church, as a community, as Brisbane, in recent memory, we've experienced revival. We should be yearning for it. Lord, come down. And as it says in Isaiah 64, verse 1, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Pray that prayer. Because having ones and twos coming to faith is great. Having thousands coming to faith is even better. Having this church, as Byron has said before, have like not just two services or three or four, but have 11 services because so many people just want to hear about Jesus. Right? Be yearning for revival, yearning for Jesus to come down and do a new thing by His Spirit. 
I'm excited by what I read here in Acts 2. And I have a longing to see that in our church, and I hope you do too. A longing to see our church totally transformed. And even if it's just for a season, that is going to affect us for the rest of our lives. That is going to affect people for the rest of their eternities. Yes, we should be longing and praying for revival. I know many of us do. But if you haven't thought about it before, please come along to the morning prayer groups for Byron Runs in the Mornings. Come along to the Thursday night prayer groups. Come along to the AGM and we're going to have a time of prayer after that as well. In your connect groups, wherever we are, talking about revival, praying about revival, yearning the Holy Spirit to just overwhelm and overcome our weaknesses. Because I tell you what, I've got a lot of them. I'm an introvert. I'm not fantastic with conversations. I need Holy Spirit's strength. I know there are many others who are like me. And if he comes and pours out something new, then even people like me, he can use. And I want to see that. I want to be a part of that. And I hope you do too. We can't force revival. We can't work up to it. We can't earn revival. But we can faithfully pray. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Ask Jesus to do something in our lives in a new way that can't be 